I'm thrilled to have uh, the IFYC community with us today. I'm uh, especially thrilled to have our panelists and my friends and board members, Mary Hinton and Fred Davey, and we will be uh, joined by Lori White presently, we hope, uh, a friend and the president of DePaul University. This is gonna be in a very exciting conversation and a very timely conversation. Um, I wanna give a special thanks to my colleagues, uh, Becca Hartman Pickerel and Catherine O'Brien for all the work that they have done behind the scenes to make this happen. Uh, um, their standards of excellence is, is what makes webinars like this so special and so, uh, so striking. So without fur further ado, um, I would love to begin with uh, my first question and direct it to my friend and board member, uh, President Mary Hinton. And we'll move from there uh, uh, through um, Fred and Lori. So Mary, at, at IFYC, uh, we talk a, uh, a great deal about interfaith leadership. Um, your CV is remarkable, right? But you're also, you're even more remarkable as a person and a leader. Uh, take us through some of your experiences and and the influences that have brought you to the role that you're in now. Thank you, Ibu. Thank you for your kind words and for the opportunity to be a part of today's conversation. And good afternoon to all of our participants. Ibu, I'm not sure if you know this, but my career actually began in K-12 and my very first job out of undergrad was as an elementary school teacher. To be honest with you, I never actually aspired to be a college president. Um, when I entered higher ed, um, pretty late in my career, I would say I entered higher ed with a one-year contract. It was a contract, it was a half faculty role and half multicultural student affairs role. And it was at a wonderful Catholic institution. So from the outset, my story and my journey is a little bit different. Um, I was fortunate to enter a community that was new to me as a professional and I absolutely fell in love with higher ed um, and with working with college students and faculty. What's I think different for me though is that what has shaped my journey more than anything else has been my feelings of being an outsider in this world of higher education. Um, as a black woman, higher ed even or perhaps particularly as a student presented challenges to me. And it was those challenges that have fashioned my leadership most of all. You know, I will say that I never quite felt at home in college. I, I always felt like an outsider. I was made to feel like an outsider, oftentimes explicitly, nearly always implicitly. And institutions like the one I attended had just not been built for nor had their success predicated on people like me um, as a first generation, low income African-American woman, I was not who New England Liberal Arts Colleges was built for. And so I very much felt like an outsider. And what's interesting is I continue to find that in higher ed today. You know, I learned 30 years ago that I was different and that that difference was not always going to be embraced. And as a leader, as a black leader in higher ed, I continue to often feel different. Part of that is, is just the numbers, only 5% of US college presidents are women of color. So in many ways, I remain an outsider and those early experiences, I think really shaped me. I share that because when I think about my experience or my leadership as the president of Holland University, I don't want any student to ever feel as I felt. I don't want them to feel like an outsider. So much of my interest in inclusion and educational equity, my commitment to the liberal arts is because I want particularly students for whom the higher ed system was not built. I want them to feel at home. I want them to feel as if they have a right to this education and as if, um, they belong and have an ownership stake in our institutions. And I'll just end by saying, you know, that was certainly helped that that sense of commitment to community was born and raised in Catholic higher ed. My time in Catholic higher ed was truly a gift. Um, it was great to be able to live into the phrase between faith and reason, there is no conflict. And I love that. But what I learned was that that time in Catholic higher ed was never about 
doctrine or even a denominational perspective that I needed to cling to. It was about a way of being in the world, an inclusive, embracing way of being in the world. And it helped fashion how I encounter and embrace the people that I serve. So even now, as I lead a secular institution, that approach, that encounter, that posture of service, that posture of encounter and embrace remains very much a priority for my leadership and for how I hope to engage students, faculty, and staff. So as a consummate outsider, um, that's, that's the lens through which I view my work and my service and has really most of all shaped my leadership journey. Mary, thank you for that. I mean, it's, it's enormously powerful. I say that as, as a friend um, and as somebody, who, you know, we've, we've been friends for several years and I know, I know a little bit of the texture of that, but basically unpacking our past, especially those of us who occupy leadership positions and what we do for a living is we perform the role of leader and it oftentimes hides what it, it hides the outsiderness that we have gone through and maybe even still feel right so it is enormously moving for you to have shared that thank you um hello to my friend lori white the president of DePaul university who i met when she was running student affairs at washington university welcome thrilled to have you so i want to direct um uh, the first question at you, and we're trying to get Fred uh, Fred Davy back on. Um, uh, somehow the system kicked him off. But Lori, um, as you heard uh, uh, our friend and colleague, President Mary Hinton, do so powerfully, if you could, if you could tell the story, your personal and professional journey that brought you to the position that you're you're in now. Um, uh, how is it that you wind up president of DePaul University? What has influenced and shaped you along the way? Oh, we can't hear you. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. Keep your eye on the prize. Oh, we'll understand it better by and by. I started there because I love to sing. And uh, since uh, part of our conversation today is, is about faith, I love to sing old Negro spirituals. Uh, they connect me to our ancestors uh, and they ground me uh, on those days uh, when I face the uh, ever challenges uh, that come forth to us as university leaders. And Mary, President Hinton, I so appreciated the opportunity to hear your story. And I too never imagined that I would one day become a college president. It wasn't something that I set out to become. However, talking, talking to you a little bit about my own background, uh, my father uh, was a psychologist and he said when he received his PhD in psychology, from Michigan State University that he became the first black psychologist that he had ever seen. And my sister uh, is a geologist. She's one of very few African-American women geologists in the country. And now I too, like President Hitt, am college president. I am the first African-American college president at DePauw and the only African-American college president in the entire state of Indiana. And so like President Hinton said, I come from a family of pioneers, um, also come from a family uh, that believes in service and also comes from a family that believes in paying life forward. And so uh, when I was offered the position of president of DePauw, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to say yes, understanding the challenge that I would be facing and didn't even know it would be even more challenging given COVID. But I remember when I visited the campus and I was contemplating whether I wanted to say yes to an offer that I was pretty sure was going to come my way. I had a chance to go uh, to one of the iconic buildings on campus and it's the building where they have all the portraits of the former presidents. And I'm president number 21 and as I looked at the previous portraits of the 
DePaul University presidents and at the same time was asking for a sign from the higher power as to what I should do. I got to the place where the portrait for number 21 will hang and I heard the voice say loud and clear, you need to say yes, not just for you, um, but for future generations of this institution and to hopefully be an inspiration to young women, uh, people of color and others who might have never imagined that somebody lo who looks like me and who looks like President Hinton would one day be president of a liberal arts college in rural Indiana. And so uh, that's ultimately how I ended up here, um, based I think on my family commitment to service, to paying life forward, and to understanding that we do this work not just for us, but hopefully to inspire the generations that come after us. Yeah, thank you for that. Thank you, President White. Very powerful. Fred, my friend of 20 years, you're either gonna have to sing or you're gonna have to recite poetry. Um, uh, in all seriousness, thank you for being my friend. Thank you for being a board member at IFYC and, and help illuminate the same journey that Presidents Hinton and White just did. You know, um, uh, what is the journey of Fred Davey to being the Executive Vice President of the Union Theological Seminary? Thank you, um, Ibu. And I wanna to say to Dr. Hinton and Dr. White, um, I'm very inspired uh, by your stories and put in the unfortunate position of following you, but uh, following both of you. But um, uh, very inf inspiring, very impressive stories and really appreciate your contributions and, and the work that you do. Um, I feel like my job has brought me full circle. Um, uh, I met the president of the Union Seminary uh, where I serve as executive vice president when we were both students uh, 40 years ago at Yale Divinity School. And then we found ourselves together uh, 10 years uh, ago, 30 years later, um, uh, where we will probably, um, and most likely I know I will, and she may too finish out our careers. But this started for me, uh, I'm the product of the tail end of official segregation in the South. Um, I, uh, one summer, uh, was kicked out of a local amusement park by the cops at nine years old because a group of us dared to go to the park on a day that the only day that was reserved for colored as they called it was tuesday and we dared to go on a day other than tuesday um, and then a year later uh, my black school all black school was closed and schools were in quotes integrated and actually i was sent to a school uh, that was pro probably at that time only 10% black, having at um, a year before uh, been in a totally segregated situation and uh, been kicked out of a park by police officers. And now um, I find myself in a, at age 10 in a completely, nearly completely white um, institution. Um, that did two things for me, I think. One is it showed me clearly the, um, the dark side of human nature um, and what we are capable of. But it also showed me the other side because I made deep and lasting friends with um, a lot of the white students, even to this day uh, at that, you know, from, from the fifth grade forward. And even now, particularly with the advent of Facebook and things like that, we are friends. But I, I take that, I brought that experience uh, to both college in North Carolina and then Yale Divinity School, uh, and then ultimately uh, coming to New York City after, after Yale, uh, being ordained as a Presbyterian minister, uh, uh, actually not to work in a church, uh, but to do uh, nonprofit work and nonprofit management. So the big buckets for me along this journey, um, you know, have been nonprofit management, uh, government um, and particularly politics and government uh, and philanthropy um, and now here uh, at a seminary uh, in higher ed. And I bring, I hope all of those um, experiences to this position with the understanding that we have to stabilize an institution, uh, prepare an institution for the future and prepare and train leaders for the future, not just clergy 
people, which we do, uh, but not in the numbers that Union Seminary did in the past, but people who are gonna be public policy advocates and social service providers um, and change agents and community organizers. So, um, and I bring to that sort of, I hope a sense of um, uh, what it means to be committed to uh, trying to leave the world a little bit better than we found it and trying to instill that in students that that is a pretty good way to order um, and manage uh, your lives uh, or their lives. Um, and um, it's a pretty good uh, way uh, for building um, a profession um, and for um, finding one's way in this world. So, um, so, you know, so it started for me um, in, in the segregated South um, and uh, it's come full circle at Union Seminary, both in terms of my relationship to the president and what we believe we need to do, but also in terms of where we are um, in, in, a, in the nation now, still grappling and wrestling with issues of race and still trying to develop and build leaders that can uh, deal with that big question and, and many others. Thank you for that. So I, you know, um, I, I just want to ob observe out loud. I'll kind of let this hang, and if, if you, if any of you want to address it as part of the the next question or further on in the program, please feel free. But I wonder, as you know, Fred, you and I have known each other for for twenty plus years, right? I mean, you. I, it's the first time I heard the story of, of you daring to go to an amusement park at nine, not on a Tuesday, and the consequences, right? And I, I just wonder how, in a very intimate and personal way, um, are these comfortable stories to recount? Are they useful stories to recount? For, you know, uh, uh, President White speaks of a, uh, of um, what is it? What does it mean to think about future generations, right? Uh, President Hinton spoke about just the, the New England elite college. New England college wasn't built for for her in mind. What what is at the intersection of perhaps the discomfort of some of these stories um, of sharing and of creating a space for for certain kinds of other people to know that they're not alone. Right. I make that as an observation. Um, uh, I'll, I'll kind of continue down the, the list of questions we discussed, but feel free to, to make your own observations related to that as, as you might um, uh, over the course of the program. Um, so let's shift for a moment to, uh, to this particular moment in, in, in American history, which you know, President Hinton, in, in our kind of uh, chit chat before, before we went live, you know, said, you know, we're, it's the intersection of a pandemic and injustice and economic crisis and she and and a set of other things as well and she recounted she she said boy does she feel sympathy for first time college presidents she was speaking about you president white <laughs> she's she's had her first rodeo in minnesota before moving up to virginia but um you know it is it is a a remarkable time in in american history um what particular responsibility do you feel as a black higher education leader and what do you need from other communities? And define those other communities uh, um, however you might. I mean, if you want to send a coded message to your board in this webinar, feel free. We will, <laughs> we will pass along accordingly. Um, but what, what response, uh, how heavy is the burden on your shoulders? Um, how clear is the vision? And what do you need from other people? And why don't we begin with uh, you, President White, and go to, to uh, Fred and Mary next, and then we'll switch the order up again. Uh, um, next time. Well, I certainly appreciate hearing the personal stories, Fred and Mary. I, I think those are really, really important in this particular time and space. I think often students on our campus, others, um, see the president as a, and I think to the extent where we're able to share our personal stories uh, with racism, with sexism, with growing up in neighborhoods or attending institutions uh, that were not made for us. Um, it helps humanize 
uh, the role of the president in ways that I don't know uh, always occur on college campuses. Uh, and it also helps folks understand that we are with them in the journey, that we are not walking in this space apart from the other members of our community, which I think is both a gift and a burden. Um, I think it's a gift in that I know that on my campus, um, our students of color and our women uh, and others who are marginalized feel very hopeful uh, that I have been selected as the 21st president of DePauw. It isn't something that many folks on our campus and many alumni ever thought would happen uh, at my institution. And at the same time, there is a, I don't want to call it a burden because I don't feel it as a burden, um, but I often feel overwhelmed um, by the hope uh, that people are placing in me and my leadership as the first African-American president of this institution uh, and expecting me to um, turn things around uh, in a way that uh, I hope that I'm able to do. Um, I, I mean, turn things around uh, in terms of how people have felt about being marginalized at the institution and hoping that, very hopeful, that an African-American president will be able to um, affirm uh, the way it is in which many have felt on our campus and actually do something about changing uh, this institution in a positive way. So I, I know that is why uh, I was hired. I hope I am able to live up to those expectations, um, but it is a lot uh, to put on one person uh, and one person can't do this work alone. Thank you. I, I would say, um that um, also the stories are are extremely important. I was uh, I just picked up Ibrahim uh, Kendi's um, book on how to be a anti-racist. I think is the title, and it's it I'm very pleased to see that he starts with his story uh, as a as a as a you know as a boy growing up um, uh, in, in the South in Florida, as I recall. So. I think recounting these stories for young people, um, particularly young people of color and young black people, um, is really important because it it uh, it articulates the journey. Uh, it does remind them that um, real people uh, went before them and continue to try to uh, pave a way in a world that is not always receptive to who we are. Um, that is done with a sort of sense of hope um and optimism and joy um about what life has to offer and in fact the struggle itself um is all of those incorporates all of those things hope um and 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 joy and optimism um and so try to instill in them that that going through this struggle does not have to be um uh an unhappy or or difficult burden necessarily uh, but there are uh, opportunities to celebrate and to accomplish much in the midst of um, a world that can be that can be unwelcoming at times and hostile. And so, um, at Union, um, you know, it's it's my job to try to ensure that we have an institution that um, is running um, as efficiently and as well as it can. Um, that we think about new opportunities uh, for the future. Uh, and that we're intentional about the students we recruit and then how we prepare them for the world. Uh, so, um, and, and, you know, I come to Union, um, a, a place where we've never had a black president. Uh, we've had Serene as the first woman president um, in a school that was established in 1836. Um, and we've never had a black executive vice president um, at the school. Um, uh, and and so the two, I guess there are probably two primary things I would say. One is that um, I bring my black experience to this job in a way that I will hope will be of value not only to uh, the black students at Union Seminary, but all students at Union Seminary, uh, and all the ways in which that story, uh, my story might help inform how they write their stories going forward. 
But also I come to this job as someone who has had um, a successful career, who's accomplished some things, and I want to use what I've learned and what I've accomplished along the way in doing the job that I do at Union so that we do leave behind when we exit that place, an institution that uh, generations um, coming after us uh, can actually um, uh, uh, take advantage of and have as a place to learn and grow um, and develop into those successive generations of, of leaders. Um, so stories are important. Uh, they, are, um, they are the yeast, in a sense, to uh, the bread that we are making with our uh, lives, both professionally and personally. Uh, and uh, just to continue the metaphor, bread that then feeds uh, generations that, uh, that, that come after us. That was really helpful to hear that feedback. And I guess I will pick up um, in answering the latter part of your question, Ibu. You know, early in my first presidency, I really wrestled with how much should one's individual story influence one's leadership? And now what I know clearly is that your history, your story is inseparable from your leadership. Your story is what got you into that role. It's what shaped your journey. And your story is your lens. And I think particularly as an African-American woman, that lens is how I see the world. And I have to embrace that to get through. And I say that because that lens shapes how I encounter every single student I serve and how every student I serve encounters me, they bring their lens. And I think part of understanding, respecting, and sharing your own story is what enables you to reach out to a student of any background, and it gives you the compassion to hear their story, to encourage them to share their story, and to think through how their story is not only shaping their journey, but how their story can help shape your institution. So I, I don't think you can separate the two. Maya Angelou has a quote that there is no agony like an untold story inside you. And there are many agonies that we face as leaders and holding that story inside me didn't have to be one. So I felt that I needed to reveal it. And I think a, good, a big part of your professional development particularly as a black person in higher education is reconciling that story because the spaces in which we dwell are not spaces that again were built for us. I often felt I had to create this third space. So the campus I attended, that campus wasn't built for me. But to be honest, my spaces at home no longer fit me once I had had this other experience. So a lot of my life was creating this third space in which to dwell, in which to hold intention, those two experiences. And for better or for worse, and this gets to I, the other part of your question, Ibu, for better or for worse, our students of color are still trying to navigate that third space, as I call it. Um, our students are still trying to figure out how do they achieve success in environments that weren't created for them. How do they navigate learning in a classroom when they are also called upon to teach and to correct and to stand up for and advocate for themselves? And so that still happens. I think I'm most struck at this moment by how little has changed in our sector over the past um, several decades, how the demands that we hear from students today are similar to the demands that we likely all made when we were students as well. So I would say an answer to your question about what this moment is like, Ibu, you know, when everything you think you know is taken away from you, when you realize you have nothing to lose, when your very foundation is shaken, as has happened to us since March, I think you were called to act. I think that we have been emboldened by this pandemic. And I think you realize in an unprecedented moment that other unprecedented things can emerge. And I think that's partly why we're seeing this 
needed movement around racial and social justice. Why not? If we can live in a world where students are doing school all online, if we can live in a world where we're wearing masks as we should at all times, if we can live in a world where 190,000 people are dying from a virus, we can do it. We can figure out how to correct a lot of ills. So the world that definitely shifted in the spring of 2020, um, a number of people have said, you know, how do you make sense of this new racial strife? And my response is that we've been living in racial strife. We're now starting to heal. And we may not like, some people may not like what the healing looks like, but the strife has long been there and we're starting to name it and figure out what to do with it. And I think we have to do that. So this moment offers us the opportunity to aggressively heal, to take charge of our healing, to help others see the healing. Um, the last thing I'll just add is you ask about the burden. Does the burden feel heavier right now? And I guess I would say to that, um, the responsibility to lead has always felt heavy to me. If anything, there may be a modicum of relief because before, before May, the hurt that our students felt, the pain that they felt, the dismissal that they felt, the condescension that they felt was readily denied by others we were told, you know, that didn't really happen. It wasn't about race. You don't understand. There's less of that today, I think, and that's a good thing. People understand that our students are hurting. They understand the need for reconciliation, the need to see the pain. So while the, while the responsibility is always great, and I wouldn't want it any other way, there has been, I think, a wider recognition of the pain, which helps a bit in our need to lead every student we serve. I have to make sure every Holland student is served well, and um, there are great opportunities for that right now. Mary, yeah. may I follow up on, on a, a really important point that you made about often feeling as if we had to live separate lives uh, and show up as separate people? Um, you know, there was a persona that showed up and more at work. There was a persona that showed up at home. Uh, and I think what we are now experiencing um, is that there is great validation in us showing up as our authentic selves in this moment. Uh, and that is really important affirmation for our students to see us showing up as our authentic selves because it allows them to understand as you have said so eloquently, they are not alone in their pain. <laughs> they are not alone in their advocacy. Um, they are not alone in articulating um, why this moment is so important right now. And so if there's been a gift <laughs> to what has been occurring, is it is allowing us, it's certainly allowing me to uh, show up as my authentic self uh, every day in my, new, in my role as the new president, as opposed to feeling that I have to be a different kind of Lori um, when I you know, enter the building in which I now work uh, and then take off that Lori when I go home. It's really well said. And you know, that's one of the lessons of, of leadership is that you know, I eventually realized I can only be me. I, I, the exhaustion of having to switch on and off all the time, the fact that your family always gets the worst version of you because you've switched on and off so many times at work, that is not a sustainable way to lead. And I would say to you know, our, our folks listening in that I understand, I, you know, I, I thought I needed to be someone else to be a president. You look around, I, I go to meetings, I look around and I would be the only person who looked like me in the room. And you think, well, I've got to be more like these other folks. That was never going to happen. And honestly, it's not what our students need. The students at DePaul need President White to be President White because her story equips her to do something for and with them that no one else can do. So I think being 
relieved of what was a real burden of feeling like you had to be a certain type of person to be a college president. That is freeing. And I think our students really, and again, all of our students need to see that. And particularly our most vulnerable students need to know, and I say this every opportunity I get, that they are enough, that as they are, as they come to us, they are enough. And certainly there is a faith component to that. But it's also, if, if we've learned nothing else since March 12th, I hope that we have learned that our humanity is really all we have and that reaching out and seeing another's humanity is the greatest gift we can give them. And as leaders, we deserve that as well. Ibu, I can't add a lot to what these two uh, uh, leaders have said, except to say that um, there is no substitute for leading an integrated life, uh, particularly as a leader, but even more so as a human being. Um, I'm reminded of um, uh, Caleb Carr's uh, historical uh, fiction book about uh, New York City. And at the beginning of that, it's called The Alienist. And at the beginning of that book, he defines what um, an alienist is. And it's actually an early name for um, a psychiatrist or, or a psychologist who were dealing with people who were, quote, alien from themselves. Um, and I think one of the uh, uh, issues that any individual faces in this world, but I think particularly uh, 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 students of color, is how easy it is to become alienated from our core, particularly um, because what we value is often challenged as not being of worth. Um, and so as I think um, uh, Dr. White and Dr. Hinton have said in different ways, the tendency could be to try to pursue, to try to be like that other thing, you know, to try to be like that other culture, that um, to try to fit in. And, you know, some of that is, is, is necessary. Uh, but at the end of the day, um, the only thing that makes getting through these jobs, it seems to me, these positions, these opportunities actually, to get through them successfully, is to do it as an authentic and integrated person. Um, otherwise, a lot of energy gets invested in trying to hold up something that isn't true, that isn't at the core of who we are. Um, and, uh, and that's energy that's taken away from uh, being the, uh, the agent uh, that we are called to be in the positions uh, where we find ourselves. Um, so I, wanna, I want to uh, reinforce and support uh, the notion of authenticity and really the notion of living um, integrated lives and the, to know sort of the true self and to let that be at the core of what we do. I'm, I'm so struck by so much of this. And I just want to uh, maybe reflect back one or, one or two pieces before moving on to the final part of, of the questions that I've got. But one thing, uh, you know, Mary, your, your, your just striking uh, comment that in some ways, the, in, in what is probably the most challenging time in American history since World War II and the Depression, right? Just like as kind of a, a semi-objective kind of matter of where we stand as a nation. Um, in some ways, the burden feels lighter because the agony is lifted because these stories, there are spaces for, for these stories to be shared. Right, and so so the, the 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 structural barriers are the, the the structural challenges are higher, and yet the spaces are being created for stories to be shared, and you don't have to feel like you're the only one. You don't have to feel like like you know like pe uh, black people, particularly black women, don't get to just be participants. Right, if you're the first black psychologist, you're not just a participant, you're, and you're not just a leader, and you're not just a pioneer, you're a builder. You are always architecting, as Mary said, you're always creating a, a third space. And, and to do that in a way that feels, you know, to pick up on a little bit of what Fred said, uh, uh, the double consciousness that Du Bois talks about, right? Um, and to not be able to share it. You know, I just, just did an interview 
uh, for a book I'm working on with an IFYC uh, um, alum and a woman named Reverend Jen Bailey, who leads something called the Faith Matters Network. And she said, part of what substantive conversations about race, the gift it gives, is that you realize it's not in your head, right? The, it's the institution, right? The problem is not your skin color, it's somebody else's eyes. And, and you know, she's, she, she was, she's like, you realize you're not the crazy one. You know, it's, it's the way things have been set up and you're actually pretty remarkable for having adapted to it, you know? And you all are like triply remarkable for architecting in the midst. So thank you, thank you for all of that. Um, uh, it, so I'm gonna join the last two questions uh, um, here and, and, and it's gonna be about higher education, right? And, and, and part of what I wanna ask is, is as you see it, what's the aim of your institution, how does it have to adapt at the intersection of the various crises we face, right? The pandemic, the racial reckoning, the economic crisis, and how are you helping it adapt so that it helps build the next 50 years and, and, and instead of only the next five months? Right, so, so what's the ultimate aim of the institution, of Hollins, of DePauw, of Union? How, what's the adaptation that's, that's taking place? And um, uh, what does that mean for the next 50 years? And I cannot help a, a, a music reference, especially after the way you introduced yourself, Lori. I think it was, I think it was said about uh, uh, Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker was walking down the street one day and heard a mistake in jazz and called it bop and built the next era, right? What, what are we doing now that sets us up for the next 50 years and that still achieves the mission of our institutions? So I'll, I'll jump in, um, uh, and I'm not sure how well my connection is. So uh, if I seem a little bit jumpy and off, uh, let's blame it on the JW Marriott here in Washington, DC. Um, but um, at the center of my job is strategic planning, um, working with the board and students, uh, staff, alums, and others to uh, lay out a plan for the school for the next 20 to 50 years. Um, and at the heart of the mission uh, of Union Seminary is this uh, phrase we use. Um, it's where uh, faith and scholarship meet to reimagine the work of justice. So in some real practical ways, um, we have to uh, put in place um, those fundamentals that will keep this institution going. And I'm sure Dr. Hinton and Dr. White know, as, as probably many of the listeners here in Ibu, you as well, know what those are. I mean, you know, we've got to have, uh, we've got to have the resources, the financial resources, uh, not just in the immediate, but, you know, we want to look 50 years down the road and say, all right, how do we continue to make sure that those resources are there, particularly as a private um, institution uh, that uh, doesn't receive a whole bunch of public funding. How can you ensure that, that those resources are there? What are you doing about the physical plant, for example, uh, to, uh, to uh, try to anticipate the 21st century and how that, that gets developed? And then um, ultimately, um, what we're really about is how do we recruit and educate and retain and support students um, and, and build leadership uh, for this current age, for, for, the, for the age to come. And, and it's, it's, it's extremely um, challenging now, it seems to me, because the world has changed so much. And I don't know what the faith world is gonna look like in America in 50 years. I don't know what church is gonna look like. Um, I don't know what race relations in this country or the world are gonna look like, but what, I do know is that um, there are some um, basics that uh, as an institution uh, we need to impart to our students uh, um, around things like building community, uh, finding new ways to relate to each other, rethinking even as seminary students, but especially seminary students, the economy 
and how and 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 how we think about what a just economy looks like and means and how we make that happen. Technology and its impact and influence uh, on um, on the lives of all Americans, but particularly in terms of vocation and livelihoods and the ability to thrive and grow. So we have to, uh, just to bring this to a close, we have to make sure that the institution um, um, has a strategic uh, underpinning and has real uh, uh, achievable plans um, and goals for its future. Um, and then we need to take all of that and are required to take all of that and invest it uh, in these students um, and uh, around these both pressing questions now that they face, we face, but also the ones that they'll face in the future that we're not quite sure um, about how they, they will look or, or what they will, what will comprise them, but to give them those uh, fundamentals and those basics to be able to engage them when, when, when they do arise. Mary, would you like to jump in? Absolutely, Ibu. So I, our true north at Holland University is to provide a rigorous liberal arts education to young women at the undergraduate level and to women and men at the graduate level. And that fundamental core of our mission is, is unchanged by COVID. We want to ensure that any young woman who wants a liberal arts education has access to that. What I think has happened in the face of COVID though, is that those things that once made us, like many small liberal arts institutions, more vulnerable are actually working in our favor at this moment. An intentionally small size, the ability to know all of your students, our rural location, um, the active engagement of alumni to provide opportunities. Those things really are a strength and a resource for us at this moment. It has enabled us to do things that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. Our commit, the faculty and our commitment and our knowledge of each of our faculty members and their strength has served us well. So for me, the challenge as we look beyond COVID is how do we maintain the core of that mission and not have these current strengths turn into liabilities again as we emerge out of COVID. So how can we continue to hold on to those things that are giving us strength now when the pendulum swings and it's no longer an advantage? And what I mean by that is how do we look at what's going on right now related to COVID, the economy and inclusion and prepare ourselves to emerge in a continued position of strength. And here's the one example that I will give. We've all heard about the demographic cliff. We all know it's real. We all know how we'll be impacted by it. But I would like to make the argument that the cliff will be longer and worse than we anticipated as a result of COVID. Um, when we, we don't talk a great deal about the impact of disrupted learning in K-12, but coming out of that sector, I will say probably my single biggest concern emerging post-COVID is the preparedness of the students that our sector in higher ed will rely upon. Um, according to the Brookings Institute, um, it looks like students are going back to school this year with less than half of their learning gains in math. Another study in the New York Times said that students will lose up to an academic year as a result of learning. I think higher ed has to be concerned about disruption, that disruption. And my question for my community at Collins is what is our role, given our strengths right now, our core mission, our true north, what is our role in addressing that coming out of COVID? And how do we leverage these strengths that again, could just as easily turn into liabilities going forward. So I think we really, I think as a sector, we need to pay more attention to what's happening in K-12. And I think for those who are concerned with communities of color and low income communities, we should be um, almost out in the streets right now with concerns about what's happening to our students and the loss of learning gains, because that's going to be a generational issue that I don't think is getting enough attention and it's on all of us in higher ed to not only bring that attention but to plan on how we're going to address that situation going forward. Wow, thank you. Another thing to lose sleep over. 
<laughs> Thank you for adding to my list. Lori. So I too am at a small liberal arts college in rural Indiana. And I think as uh, President Hinton said, uh, there have been some strengths that have been illuminated in this COVID-19 environment. All of the things that President Hinton focused on that were small, uh, we're in a rural area. And so, you know, our ability to manage uh, through COVID um, has perhaps been relatively easier um, than some of the larger institutions that uh, keep appearing in the newspaper. I also think in the larger conversation about the value of higher ed, particularly a residential experience, there were many uh, prior to COVID who would say, uh, a $10,000 um, learning from home degree um, is really all that higher ed needs to be about. Why are we spending all of this money building residence halls and uh, all of these other amenities? Well, if you think about what our students are telling us they miss, um, they miss the residential experience, not just for the opportunity to learn on site academically, but they miss all of the other things that happen on a college campus when you're in residence. So if anything, um, I think COVID-19 has actually reinforced in a positive way um, why the residential experience for uh, traditional 18 to 22 year old uh, young people uh, for many um, is uh, more of a positive choice for them than not. Uh, on the other hand, uh, as a small liberal arts college, um, we are in a very challenging space. We're expensive, and we're not located uh, in a major city. Uh, and for the population of students that will be coming to college, um, it is not the typical group of students that historically liberal arts colleges have recruited. Um, the students who will be coming to college in the future are more first generation students, more students from under resourced backgrounds, uh, and adult learners who are returning to college to get uh, skills that will help them be successful in the workforce. Those are not the students that my institution has typically recruited. And so if we're going to try to uh, be around for another 180 years, as we've been around uh, so far, we're going to have to figure out um, how to better articulate our value proposition, not only to the traditional students that we've historically recruited, but also to students uh, that will be the growing population of students that will be going to college in the future. And we haven't quite figured out how we're going to do that, but we're not going to survive uh, unless we do. Uh, and then lastly, you know, as a new college president, of course, I look at our history and, you know, I've gone to what our founders imagined when they established a PAW. And uh, when they established a PAW, our founders wanted to establish an institution based on liberal principles, accessible to all religious denominations, and designed for the benefits of our citizens in general. And so I've been asking myself, um, how do we reimagine uh, that original founding vision for the 21st century to, again, uh, I think it's really important, particularly in this time, to think about the value of the liberal arts, which is to ask questions about the human condition, to ask questions about moral and ethical issues. There is still a place for that, even though many people think of college only for the vocational aspects. I think it's really important for us to continue to think of college founding on those really important liberal questions, particularly now liberal arts questions. On um, the issue of access, our founders thought about access to all religious denominations, but I think in the 21st century, um, I would hope our founders would want us to be accessible to um, all students from a variety of backgrounds, religious, ethnicity, cultural, et cetera. Uh, and so that we should continue to be accessible. Uh, and then thinking about um, how do we prepare our students for the benefits of our citizens in general. And what does that mean? Does that mean citizens of my small community? Does that mean citizens of the state of Indiana? Does that mean citizens for our nation and, and for the world? And so I think it's a real opportunity for all of us to relook at our uh, founding principles and our mission statements and to update them for the 21st century. Boy, I wanna thank all of you for just a just a profound conversation. Uh, I, I want to thank you for, for your friendship with me and the way that you have shaped my journey and my leadership. Uh, 
Fred and Mary are board members at IFYC. Lori, uh, it, the more we get to know each other, you, I mean, you might have to add some things to your schedule. Uh, uh, don't take phone calls from me unless, unless uh, you're ready to add to your schedule. But each of you has been a powerful force in my life, and I want to thank you. And, and if you'll allow me, I want to I want to say a, um, uh, something deeper and more general about the experience that each of you are exponents of, which is the Black American experience, and just how much that has shaped my life, uh, uh, how um, how I felt much more integrated when I, you know, I remember those times reading Cornell West and Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde uh, and Martin Luther King Jr., you know, when I was 17 as an undergrad. And I think, you know, the combination of, 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 of university life and Black intellectuals has been the shaping feature of my conscious life, but it shaped me before I was even born. And, and the the very plain fact is that people like me would not be in this country without people like you. Uh, the civil rights movement very self-consciously advocated for people outside of, outside, of, outside of itself. And it is not an accident that there was an Immigration Act passed in 1965, which took down barriers of racism and American immigration. Uh, American immigration was overtly and self-consciously racist from at least 1882 to 1965. In 1965, there was an Immigration Act passed, which allowed people not from Europe to come to America, including the Patel family from South Bombay. It is because of Black people. It was because of the Civil Rights Movement that that act was passed. Um, it is a history that is almost never told. We would not be in this country because of you. Thank you for who you are, for the experience that you are exponents of, for your grace and your beauty and your courage and your friendship. Um, we have a couple of announcements, but just know deep in my heart, I am grateful to you.